Hello and welcome to the History and Overview of USB. My name is Pamela Frenzy and I will be your instructor. During this presentation, we will look at the evolution of USB, why USB was necessary, and the different versions of USB and how the different versions vary. We'll look at a little bit of the overview as far as what makes up USB, what are some of the benefits of USB and that. If you have any questions about any of the information that I cover in this presentation, please be sure to use the question and comment section located on gogo.com. So let's go ahead and get started. Again, we're going to look at the history of USB and some of the problems that are solved by USB. We'll look at the specification history, the evolution of USB's specification and revision. We'll go over the features in USB, some of the positive things that USB has brought to our connectivity PC world. Hot plugging is one of the major goals of USB, being able to plug and play, so to speak, in previous older platforms. Keep in mind that if you wanted to connect another peripheral like a keyboard after the system was already up and booted, you had to reboot the system so that that device would be recognized. And we'll look at how USB handles that. Also, isochronous traffic, handling real-time data traffic. We'll look at how USB handles that. We'll also look at air handling, how air handling is done in USB and how airs are recovered. Now, one of the things that USB, the intents of USB, was to solve some of the shortcomings of the original PCIO. We ran out, basically, of IRQ lines and IO addresses. So those are limited resources. And in fact, in USB, we basically share one set of resources amongst all the USB devices that are attached in the um, PC. Old platforms, as far as peripheral devices go, were not hot pluggable. If you powered up a system, powered up a platform, and for example, the keyboard wasn't plugged in, the system would not recognize that keyboard. There was no hot plug. The system would have to be rebooted to be able to use that keyboard. And that's because old platforms went out and looked at the peripheral connections only on boot up. So once the system was up and operational, those resources were never looked for again. In many of our peripheral devices, when you connected a new type of device, you had to install software and load software onto the machine. And that was cumbersome from an end user standpoint and not really considered user friendly. If you look at the back of a typical desktop, you'll see many, many, many connector types. And with USB, the goal in USB was to use one connector type. That does a lot of things because that doesn't limit what types of devices that you can plug into your system, how many devices you plug into your system, et cetera, et cetera. Cost. Now, cost is always an issue when a particular platform specification is introduced just to recoup the R&D cost. But relatively speaking, USB is low cost as far as a connectivity protocol. The standard connectors and cables can be costly for other devices. They may require an expansion card, for example. And then, of course, we're going to run out. If that happens, we're going to run out of room. So we wanted to address, USB wanted to address some of the issues with cost in old platforms. Now, let's compare some different interfaces. USB, of course, is the one we're going to be covering in these next modules. USB is asynchronous serial protocol. Now, the maximum number of devices is 127, and when we cover device addressing, you, you will see that USB uses a 7-bit address field. 2 to the 8th is 100, excuse me, 2 to the 7 is 128. Address 0 is reserved. We'll talk about that later on. So that leaves a possibility of 127 different devices. Now, obviously, that's probably not practical. It's not practically achievable, as you'll see when we cover bandwidth calculations. Speed in USB. Low-speed devices are 1.5 megabits per second. 
full speed devices are 12 megabits per second and high speed devices are 480 megabits per second. The length you can go up to 16 feet. You can go up to 96 feet if you have five hubs. The typical applications are keyboard, mouse, modem, disk drives. Again, your peripheral. This is a peripheral connectivity protocol. Now, RS-232 is an old serial protocol. It is asynchronous and it is serial. The maximum number of devices, though, is two. Maximum speed is 20 kilobits per second. Now, the length is longer. The length is up to 50 feet. And it's mainly used for modem connectivity and instrumentation connectivity. IEEE 1394, better known as FireWire, is a serial protocol. You can have up to 64 devices. It is 400 megabits per second in 1394A, so that's comparable to USB. But 1394B is faster than USB 2.0 in that it's 3.2 gigabits per second. Maximum length of 15 feet. It's used mainly for mass storage and higher end video. So it's a little bit more expensive as far as costs go. And that can be cost prohibitive on the standard desktop or laptop environment. Now, Ethernet. Ethernet's application, of course, is more for networking. It is a serial protocol. You can have up to 1,024 devices faster than USB at the 1G level. You can go up to 1,600 feet, which is much longer than USB. However, keep in mind it's meant for networking. IEEE 488, better known as GPIB, is a parallel bus. Maximum number of devices is 15, 8 megabits per second, so much, much, much slower. 60 feet is the length limitations, and it's mainly used for instrumentation automation. GPIB is an older interface, and actually in the instrumentation test and measurement world, we're replacing uh, GPIB or IEEE 488 with USB for the connectivity. Now let's look at the history of the spec. USB 1.0 was released in January of 96. It's low speed transfers at 1.5 megabits per second. It had full speed transfers at 12 megabits per second. USB 1.1 was released in September of 98. There was a problem. There were a couple different problems with uh, 1.0. One of the big problems with 1.0 was there was no interrupt out. Interrupt, low speed devices can only use a control and an interrupt endpoint. And there was no interrupt out. So that was a problem that was corrected with 1.1. Now USB 2.0 was released in April of 2000. It is required to be backward compatible with 1.1. So devices have to support at least full speed in the backwards compatibility. Added high speed transfers at 480 megabits per second. More than more devices can be on a single bus. And in 2000, December of 2000, an ECN was added to add the mini B connector, the mini B connector for s reducing the form size and allowing for small plug. Things like portable devices like digital cameras, for example. Now, USB on the go 1.0. On the go was released in July of 2003. And basically it allows two USB devices to communicate directly without a PC. One of the competing or competitive advantages that FireWire has over USB is that FireWire is true peer-to-peer. -peer. You don't need a host. USB is not peer-to-peer. -peer. Even on-the-go 1.0 is not peer-to-peer. -peer. The on-the-go device will have limited host capability, so it looks like a host. And we'll look at that towards the end of the modules. Now, the features in USB. Hot pluggable. So one of the things, again, that we're, we're seeing in user 
friendliness is that we want our devices to be hot pluggable. When you want to change one device and plug in another, for example, we don't want to have to power down the entire platform to be able to do that. USB will automatically detect a device being attached and configure it for use. It will automatically detect the removal of a device and wipe out its resources. Low cost is one of the things that USB wanted to make sure to make it comparable and competitive to other interfaces. So we want the USB components and cables to be relatively inexpensive. USB does supply power to its ports. So if devices can operate at 100 milliamps, they can be totally bus powered up to 500 milliamps of current and they can be bus powered from a fully rated port, which we'll see power requirements later on. Air detection and recovery, USB defines different air mechanisms, and we'll look at that. Now, C, USB 2.0 specification supports 1.5, 12, and 480 megabits per second, low, full, and high speed in order. System resources, that was an issue in older platforms in that each device had to have its own IRQ line and each device had to have address space. Well, the problem is, is we were running out of those resources. So USB basically shares one resource. Error detection and recovery is important. USB includes error detection to ensure accurate data delivery on all but one transaction type, as we'll see later on. But there are different levels of error detection and recovery that we'll look at. Now, USB is not perfect. There are user limitations. It lacks support for legacy hardware, for example. Old computers don't have USB ports, but we're finding that that's faded very quickly. So that's really not an issue anymore. That was an, an issue when USB 1.1 first came out, for example. And there are speed limitations. It's not as fast as 488, or excuse me, 1394B. It's not as fast as the second version of Firewire. Distance limitations, five meter cable limits, but other have, interfaces have longer distances. However, keep in mind, USB is meant for a, for a peripheral connectivity environment. It's not meant to go long distances. And there's no direct peer-to-peer -peer communication. As I said a minute ago, USB came up with on-the-go to allow what looks like peer-to-peer -peer communications without a host, but it's not truly direct peer-to-peer -peer communications. Now, the developer limitations, the protocol is complex. The protocol itself, the specification itself is 600 pages, 600 some odd pages. Then you also have to look at different class documents if you want your device to fall within a different class. For example, the mass storage class or the HID class. It, so it's complex. Drivers are still evolving. The development of drivers are still evolving, although over the past several years it's gotten a lot better. There are more shells for de developing drivers and people are understanding driver development more. Hardware problems. We still see some hardware problems, unfortunately. Most of the time hardware problems are timing issues. Fees, of course, you have to have a vendor ID and you have to get you have to pay to get that vendor ID from USB. So there are some costs there. Maybe difficult for small companies, for example, to to attain the vendor IDs from a cost standpoint. So that's really a little bit of a history and overview of what we're going to cover in USB 2.0. Thank you for viewing this presentation. If you have any questions or comments related to any of the information that I've covered in this presentation, please be sure to use the question and comment section that you'll find located on gogo.com.